Monday, the uh, one, one to two uh, block, we have uh, Thomas Browder and Helena Marisic. Did I get that right? Yeah. Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> yeah, they're from the College of Natural Sciences at UH Manoa, uh, and uh, they do research on physics, and that is, uh, you know, the height of the height. In, in social sciences, I always think that philosophy is the height of the height, mm -hmm. but in science, it's physics, right? It's more of a fundamental. Fundam well, you say fundamental, but it's hard. Yeah. I agree <laughs> with that. How do, you, how do you get to be a physicist, Thomas? Uh, many years of training and sort of apprenticeship or postdoc. Uh, I went to the University of Chicago and then to UC Santa Barbara. And I was a postdoc for a year and a half at SLAC, the Stanford University of the Campus. And I was a postdoc for six years at Cornell. Call oh, it their accelerator. Mm -hmm. Look who Mark Young, young for all that, that training. training. <laughs> <laughs> It's also a fear that they may feel I was working with how many years of education you had, <laughs> and you usually go 20 plus. <laughs> 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 Only then I do you want to uh, give your background? Yeah, how about your, how about your background? Uh, well, I got my... That's Helena, Helena with a J. J-E-L-E-N-A. It's actually Helena. Helena, sorry. Helena is better than Helena, which is a common way people read it. Uh, I got my bachelor's at uh, University of Belgrade in Serbia. Uh, then I actually got my PhD at the University of Hawaii in this department. So now I'm one of the faculty, John Leonard. Uh, and then after that, I spent six years at Drexel University as a, as a professor. And then two years ago, I actually came back uh, to, to UH again. Okay. Coming back to alma mater. Okay, so you guys work together but not together. Explain how, how that, that okay, is. So we're part of the uh, University of Hawaii High Energy Physics Group, which uh, has a number of faculty. Uh, some of us collaborate together on the same projects, but in this particular case, Yelena and I work on independent projects, both of which are very fascinating. We'll try to give you mm -hmm. some flavor of that today. And what are your independent projects these days? Okay, so I'm working on research on matter and antimatter. My research is mostly related to neutrinos, uh, the smallest particles that we know. The neutrino is a small, smaller than an atom. Yeah. Neutrino is they, the, the scientist that actually uh, was responsible for discovering neutrino. He said that's the tiniest amount of matter known to human being, much, much more than an atom. It's so small we actually haven't succeeded in measuring the mass yet. We just know it's lighter than a certain amount which is much smaller than electron, actually. Well, I'm going to ask very you how we know it, it exists at all. That's a clever question. <laughs> <laughs> so who wants to begin? It was I mean, the who? physics laws, actually. <laughs> Let's start with you, OK. OK, so tell me, tell me about neutrinos. <laughs> tell me about why you're doing neutrinos, what you're doing with them, and what, and what kind of hypothesis you're working well, on. Well, we like to do a lot of things with them. They're very elusive. <laughs> <laughs> it's so tiny. <laughs> They're very tiny, that's right. They're not just tiny, but uh, they don't carry charge. Like Everything around us is actually governed by charge. Electrons have charge, protons have charge, but neutrinos don't. So most of the time, it's just stream for us. Like through us together, probably trillions and trillions of neutrinos going every second of our life. So, <laughs> and us not being uh, damaged by that or our health being okay means they just don't don't act on us. They just go through. So, which is great for everyone except neutrino physicists, because <laughs> the only way you study them is when they interact very rarely. But then coming back to your original questions. Um, how we first suspected that they are there, being so elusive, was actually non-conservation of physics law. So people were studying one interaction where they were thinking they are getting two particles out. But that means that it took physics laws uh, demand that be those particles, if you like, the speeds of the particles can be predicted. But when they measured, they got all sorts of values. People even question energy conservation at that point. Interesting. <laughs> well, you know, there might be secrets. I mean, to throw an idea at it you. Is, it is. There but might you be know, secrets where we could find that all this. The reef is get a little bit sensitive. We don't like to break it so just like that. So someone actually came up and said, you know what? There may, may be another particle. Because it turns out if there are three particles, then they have energy and speed, whatever. 
And that's how this, the first quest took, took place. It took 25 years. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, yeah, so anyway, they are, um, in that sense, they are, they're, uh, they're very secretive because they are there, they're everywhere, but it's so hard to, to actually get a hold of them. And then what we do, we either build giant detectors, uh, detectors that are as high as buildings, or we get very high neutrino sources. So in my case, uh, we actually use nuclear reactors. It turns out that nuclear reactors produce 10 to the 20 neutrinos per second. So it's like 10 with 20 zeros behind it every single second. <laughs> <laughs> and then we get our detector, which is again, you know, it's like a 10 meter tall detector. So we're talking decent size, uh, relatively close to it. And then we hope that some of those neutrinos, and they do from time to time interact, and that's how we learn about their properties. Ah. So I mean, you, you got my, my, my head going into this little tiny world with it all these things buzzing tiny. and flying. And very bizarre. Everything works yeah. the way you don't expect. <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, but there are rules, though. Absolutely, of course. Absolutely. Physics is a study of rules. That's right. Yeah, finds out exactly how they yes. conduct themselves yes. and all that. So I mean, we're going back to the thought that, uh, okay, we know that, you know, atoms do strange things, and you can mm -hmm. excite them, and they make explosions and all that. Um, but maybe if you could capture other particles, really tiny particles, and make energy out of that, and if they're all buzzing around like you were describing. Then maybe we could find an, a, you know, an unending source of energy all around us. Is this possible? We can be very effective at converting the energy. <laughs> a little box, for every very tiny. <laughs> <laughs> Only joking. <laughs> but I mean, who knows? That might be a good segue to antimatter. Yes. Okay. <laughs> all right, we're going to come back. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. okay. So, 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 what, so, what is antimatter? Okay, so I mean, can I put up some slides? Yeah, let's pull up some slides. Okay, we got some slides here. Okay. We can look at them so, right now. Here we go. There it is. So I'm going to talk a little bit about my research, which is the Bell II experiment in Japan. It's research on matter and antimatter. But I, well, before I get into all the technicalities, let's just get to the grassroots here. Okay, grassroots. Okay. So a question for is you. Is this from your course that you teach? No. This no. is this is just for us. This is for you. All right. Wow. Well, <laughs> thank you, Thomas. Uh, okay. You can call me Tom. Okay. <laughs> um, so, I have a question for you. What is the most famous equation in physics? Everybody knows. E equals mc squared. Well, that's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you mean E does not equal mc squared? No. You're very close. <laughs> <laughs> the correct equation is E squared equals mc squared squared. You mean Einstein was wrong? just a little incomplete. This was figured out by Dirac, the guy on the right, uh -huh. very eccentric, introverted British physicist. Uh -huh. And this has two solutions. Okay, so either E equals mc squared, or E equals minus mc squared, negative energy solutions. Ah, and it's the one on the right that you're interested in. Well, this is the one, so Dirac, the, the introverted British physicist, figured out that the negative energy solutions have a physical meaning. Okay. And they correspond to the antimatter counterparts of the matter particles. Okay. But but why anti? It sounds so adversarial. Okay. It well, okay, let's get let's get to why is it anti? So for every particle, every fundamental particle even whizzing the around. Neutrino? Even the neutrino. Even the neutrino. Yes, yes, even <laughs> okay. the neutrino. You guys get along and everything, right? Yeah. Yes, yeah. <laughs> That's because physics has rules. <laughs> and, as and, long as you and, expect. And you'll find out that at the end, she's actually studying the same thing. Uh, oh, I love a show like that. <laughs> it all comes together. Yes. That's right. <laughs> okay. Uh, so for every particle, there is an antiparticle. Okay? And the part uh, particles and antiparticles are almost identical, except the charges, the electric charges, are opposite. Okay. So there's proton, antiproton, yeah. electron, positron or anti-electron. Yeah. Okay. So what happens when particles and antiparticles come together? Um, nothing. They just, they, they come together into zero. They neutralize each other. No. Huh. No. When, Seemed like a good guess. No. When matter and antimatter meet, they, they, explode. Uh, they annihilate and make photons. Yeah. And, and a photon, does that have something to do with light? Light, light, light. Yeah. 
Okay. This You're is right. Light. The yeah, photons are light energy. is particles. It can be produced by particles, antiparticles, annihilating or other processes. Yeah. Okay. Because what's energy? Like that energy must it's have energy, a form, but that, right? That it's gone. But it's photons. That it, it energy is actually photons. You can photons. keep a, a proton, yeah. right? Yeah. You can put them in your pocket. Correct. But you can't keep a photon. That's right. Yes. This goes away. It They're packages the of, of energy. Yeah. That's how nature packages energy in photons. Okay. okay. Nature. Okay. Don't fool with Mother Nature. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, so it's real. Um, 1936, Carl Anderson climbed up a mountain in the suburbs of Los Angeles, took his cloud chamber, and found particles that bend the wrong way in an electric field. It looked like electrons, but bent the opposite direction, and won the Nobel Prize for that. Uh, is this picture a picture of those particles? Yeah, a cloud chamber particle. Can electron. you tell us what a cloud chamber is, Tom? Okay, uh, so it's uh, like dry ice when the particle goes through and leaves a track there, and then you photograph it. So that was the method of particle physics in the 1930s. You climb up a mountain, <laughs> take one of these cloud chambers or a photographic plate. Sometimes you fall into a crevasse. It's very romantic. <laughs> Sometimes, Sometimes short-lived. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so anyways, this was the, the, they found the anti-electron this way, okay. the cloud chamber. Okay, so now we know uh, there are What are we seeing here, though? This is tracks. a photograph? Yeah, of a photograph of the tracks in the cloud chamber. And, and this is actually at a microscopic or atomic level? Well, they, they make visible tracks. You can see that even oh. by a naked eye, you can see the tracks from the particles passing through a cloud okay. chamber. Okay, okay. So, yes, particles are subatomic, but tracks aren't. Okay, and so how, what's the actual physical size of what we are looking at? Five inches, ten yeah, inches? Yeah, yeah, something yeah. like that. Okay. Okay, so let me go back to, uh, okay. So matter versus antimatter. This is a picture of Tom Hanks and his antimatter counterpart. <laughs> uh, he made a movie called Angels and Demons, which is about antimatter and the Vatican. Uh, I remember that, but I don't remember what Okay, happened. so what happens when Tom and anti-Tom meet? Yeah. Photons. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> okay, so okay, I have one more comment before we finish on antimatter and uh, that is um, yeah, photons or equals mc squared. Okay, so I, I want to talk about the most classic, tragic, doomed story of romantic love. You know what the story is? No? Romeo and Juliet? Romeo Good. and anti Juliet. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it here on Think Tech. <laughs> You've never heard it before. <laughs> You will hear it again. It's definitely tragic and yeah. doomed. Okay. Right, you understand why it's doomed. Perfectly Shakespearean, yeah. yeah. <laughs> doomed meaning? Uh, if they ever were to make physical contact, it's all over. They annihilate. Wow. That, that's, that's a bad ending. Yeah. They can doomed. never achieve anything I mean, that just way. The, it's worse than the feud between the Montagues <laughs> and Capulets. <laughs> So what, what, why is that? I mean, why is Romeo and Juliet, why the anti matter and, anti and anti Romeo and anti-Juliet. Right, okay, okay. 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 <laughs> but actually, so <laughs> anti-Juliet is not anti-Romeo. No, it's the anti-matter counterpart of Juliet. Right, so you have Romeo, Juliet, and that's good. That's, that's fine. That's all fine. That's the classic Although there are some thing. tensions between the families, but okay. Well, okay, yeah. Well, so, <laughs> well, maybe that's part of the story. Yeah. But, okay, but then you, you go a step further and say, we're not going to talk about Juliet right now. We're going to talk about Auntie Juliet and see how she gets along with Romeo. Correct. Correct. Okay. So this sounds, it sounds mathematical. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. There, uh, there are very strict physical principles, laws even we call them, for conservation of matter and antimatter. Okay. Okay. How does it work? What happens? I mean, why? Why? Why does Auntie Juliet collide with Romeo? Because uh, energy has to be conserved because of the things I said at the beginning. We have to turn... We bring the matter and the antimatter together, and by our conservation laws, they have to turn into energy. They can't. They must. Yeah, if once they make conservation. It's a funny name for it, conservation. conservation. What's being conserved? Uh, the total amount of matter and antimatter. Ah, there's a rule. There's a rule of physics. Yes, a law. It's a law. You can't a violate law. it. A law. You physics. don't get a parking ticket when you violate this law. <laughs> no, it's, it's a real felony. Yeah. <laughs> you failed the exam. <laughs> I went to law school, <laughs> and I took philosophy, too. <laughs> there's, there's some kind of parallel here. <laughs> okay. So anyways, yeah, that, that's my introduction to the principles. So should I go on to the experiment in Japan, or? If, if Elena okay. wants you to. Yeah. 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 Okay. 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 <laughs>
Okay, so for about a decade, we were doing this experiment in Japan looking for small differences between matter and antimatter, but only for special particles, for particles containing B quarks or beauty quarks. So beauty quarks and anti-beauty quarks, we found small differences between Quark, them. is that like the computer program, the graphic Q-U-A-R-K? No, okay. okay, so we have the atom. Inside the atom is the nucleus, which yeah. contains the proton and the neutron. Yes. Inside each proton or each neutron, there are three smaller things called quarks. And they're usually up or down quarks, two ups and one down for the proton, two downs and one up. It sounds like a cell or something. A cell? A cell, like a cell with the components in the cell. Yeah, 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 uh, something like that. But, but, but these neutrinos are, are still smaller. Well, yes. the quarks are point-like too, but yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Um, but I think the difference from the cell is that they're held together with forces. They not there is no physical containment, but actually, they they like each other. If you like to an immense level, yeah. <laughs> and they always go do threesome. So it's always three of the quarks. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This is really new. They're bound by the strong force. Yes. Okay. It's it's a law. It's a law. Yeah. It's a law. <laughs> okay. Anyways, so there are up and down quarks here on Earth, and protons and neutrons. In atom smashers, you can make strange quarks, charm quarks, or beauty quarks truth quarks. Who so, thought of these charms? They're uh, amazing. Murray Gelman started this. He was a physicist from Caltech, won a Nobel Prize, had a really off-the-wall sense of humor. Yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, <I'm> not sure. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he's this is recently. Um, he's an old man now. He's in his 80s, I yes. think. Uh, so this was maybe 50 years ago when he was okay. well, that's young. Okay. fairly recent. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, physics is a fairly new science, isn't it? I mean, we didn't know anything about it, say, in the year 1900, right? No, we knew a lot, but no. not uh, anything about quantum mechanics or special okay. relativity, things like that. Okay. I guess we are very good about two forces, but then there are four <laughs> that are fundamental, and uh, two we got to know in the 20th century. Okay. <laughs> so anyways, we were doing this experiment on differences between matter and antimatter in Japan for about a decade, starting in 1999. Uh, this experiment verified that the idea of two Japanese theorists, these, oh, I'm sorry, it was on the uh, screen, okay. Kobayashi uh, on the right and Masakawa on the left. <laughs> they're, they're perfect, they're caricatures. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, they, and in uh, the center is the accelerator. Correct, and, and there's okay. a picture of the data in, in, in that plot in the center, and then the busy physicists working hard on the accelerator and the detector. Uh, so this experiment verified the idea of Kobayashi and Masakawa in around 2001. And then in 2008, Kobayashi Maskawa won the Nobel Prize in Physics. Um, there were even two professors at Hawaii, uh, Steve Olson and Sandeep Pakvasa, who were invited by Kobayashi to go to the ceremony in Stockholm. Oh, well, that means they're close. Yeah, they, they were. And they have regard for each other and all that. So what, what was the prize about? What did he do that they justified it? They provided the theoretical explanation for why there are small differences between matter and antimatter. Which, the very thing you're talking about yeah, yeah. here today at yeah, Think Tank. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, so um, here's a picture, uh, animation of the atom smasher in quotes, the machine we used at KK to do this experiment for a decade. You can see the um, electrons swirling around from the left side and the anti electrons from the right side annihilating in the center of the detector, producing B quarks and anti B quarks and then their decay products being recorded. Uh, this is all located in Tsukuba, Japan, uh, around 50 miles north of Tokyo. Uh, this is one of the best atom smashers in the world for uh, this kind of physics. It has the highest luminosity or the highest intensity of collisions. What does that mean, intensity of collision? Uh, the Can number of collisions hit, hit per square yeah. centimeter per second is the highest of any machine in the world. Okay. And how big is the thing? How big Sometimes is, they're really big. How big they? is the machine? Yeah. 3.1 kilometers around. So the monster at CERN is 27 kilometers around. So it's, a, it's, not, it's not big, you know, in, in the circumference of, it, of the actual tube, though. Yeah, the it circumference could, is 3.1 kilometers around. The tube the cross section is like that. It's right? like a yeah. few inches. Yeah, yeah. So, so you have to sort of put a pipe around Correct. in this Correct. huge. Correct. Correct. And that means you've got you to dig a hole, I suppose. Uh, there was, there, the there was a hole from an earlier machine that was there already that they used for this one. But, uh, How do you get it going that fast? Um, so, let's see. 
uh, if we look at the picture again, there is a straight section at the bottom left of the picture. That's the LINAC, or the linear accelerator. So there are cavities, uh, klystrons, or machines, that accelerate the electrons or positrons. They provide an alternating wave of electric field. It's like a surfer riding the crest of a wave. Each time you go through the cavity, you get a little kick. Yeah. And they move these uh, electrons and positrons up to 8 times 3.5 GeV. GeV is one is a unit which means billion electron volts. But you, that wouldn't kid you or anything. Uh, well, these are each particle has the each particle has the energy of a fly or mosquito. But to do this to many uh, ten to the twelfth particles, uh, it's quite a lot of energy. So yeah, you don't you wouldn't want the whole beam to be directed towards you. The beam is interlocked so that nobody can get anywhere near it. You could be hurt. Well, 10 billion mosquitoes yeah, yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. at once, <laughs> in a second. <laughs> the strength in numbers, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and okay, so now you've got these things going around. I mean, how do you start? Just you let them sit, and then the accelerator device with the electromagnetic pulsing or whatever it yes, is, yes. Uh, that just gets it started. Right, and then they go running around in the ring, yeah. in the storage ring. Okay, and what happens? I mean, who cares? Who cares? I mean, well, why it's the important? nicest way possible, but who cares? Okay. Uh, so let's get back to really fundamental stuff, cosmology, why we are here. Isn't that when you go to the beauty parlor? Right? No. That's, that's what Alex Filipenko <laughs> talked about. He found, he found an ad okay. yeah. seeking cosmologists okay. for the beauty parlor. Okay. So, oh. so, okay, so cosmology, <laughs> basic questions. Why are we here? Why, why do we exist? Okay, so at the beginning of the universe, there were equal amounts of matter and antimatter. Okay. Yet, somehow, all the antimatter has more or less disappeared. We're left with matter, a universe dominated by matter. Even if we look out in the skies, no antimatter. But it doesn't have to be that way. Uh, what do you mean? It, it could, we could have a universe that's dominated by antimatter just as easily. Yeah, it could have been. But anyways, if you start with equal amounts, you end up with one that's dominated by one of the two types, matter in this case. How do you explain that? The answer, according to Andrei Sakharov, famous Russian dissident, uh, also a great physicist, was that in the subatomic processes, in subatomic particle decays, there are asymmetries between matter and antimatter that are amplified so much from the beginning of the universe that all the antimatter disappears and we end up with matter at the end. Otherwise, we wouldn't exist. If we had equal amounts of matter and antimatter, they'd just be annihilating, turning to photons. There'd be oh, no okay. you and I. I it wouldn't that. exist. We'd yeah. be Fundamental so question. we can only tolerate a certain amount of antimatter. I mean, yeah. past a certain point, when you reach parity, yeah. that's a problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, that and what, what happens when you exceed parity? When all of a sudden you have more antimatter than matter? Well, as I say, then we live in our present universe where we have much more matter than antimatter. No, I suppose we had more antimatter. Oh, then we would have... Uh, if we had the exact, the, exactly the same fraction, then we would have an anti-universe that was exactly the same as our universe. Same thing. Yeah, yeah. So a mirror image. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Okay. We wouldn't really care because we only care if they're together, right? right? Because they, then it's dangerous. Then it's right. Romeo and Juliet. You don't want it to be parody. <laughs> but Tom, how do you know that we're not actually living in a world of antimatter? Okay. Maybe it is. If they're identical, <laughs> why why can't they be antimatter just as easily? Okay. Um, so this is a problem. So if we have extraterrestrials, if we ever meet up with some extraterrestrials, how are we going to tell that they are matter extraterrestrials or antimatter extraterrestrials? We don't want a Romeo anti Juliet situation going on. No. Okay. So can we go back to the slides again? Yeah, we're going to go back to the slides. Okay. So the second row, Jim Cronin, Val Fitch, 1964. Yeah. So they did an experiment with particles containing strange quarks called kaons. And they found that the asymmetry w between kaons and anti kaons had one particular sign. They measured a cer certain number with a particular sign. Okay, so the idea is if we meet up with uh, extraterrestrials, they should do, both sides should do this kaon experiment and check the sign of the quantity they measure, the sign of the difference between matter and antimatter, compare results. If we both get the same answer, then we know we're both matter. This is, and that's a good thing. That's a good thing. If because we get if we found opposite out. signs, 
no this good. Romeo and anti Juliet. It's a Romeo yeah. and anti Juliet situation. We should not have any yeah. contact with these extraterrestrials. Yeah. yeah. How can you explain that to them? <laughs> you know, they'll be concerned they about. May be, they're probably more advanced than us. They probably, they probably understand it anyway. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well. Well, <laughs> they are visiting us. That tells you something. <laughs> I, I, my mind, my head is splitting now. <laughs> Back to you, Helena. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so now, in this world that, that mm -hmm. uh, you know Tom is describing, where does where does the nu neutrino fit? Where do you fit? Oh uh, well, with neutrinos, we are actually seeking for a similar effect looking for difference between neutrinos and anti-neutrinos. So are you also using particle accelerators? Uh, well, we use neutrinos from reactors. That's one project I'm working on. And then we, so neutrinos also have another very peculiar feature, and that is that they uh, actually, there are three types of neutrinos, and they actually, as they, as they travel, they change between each other. We call that oscillate, which is, literally like driving a Ferrari and then as you drive <laughs> your car turns into Mini Cooper and then you drive further kind of <laughs> yeah. desperate. How much does this cost? I'd be, I'd be uh, interested in. I mean, how much does this cost? I'd be interested. Which, which project? The Mini Cooper. Ah. The Mini Cooper. <laughs> <laughs> well that one is actually not the expensive one. Accelerators are expensive. That one is not so expensive because you, you get neutrinos from free, for free from nuclear reactors. Somebody built so, the nuclear reactor already for another purpose, to generate energy. Yes. yes. You know. yes. <laughs> Luckily, so. people harness nuclear energy and they're using it to produce electricity, but by, as a byproduct, neutrinos are there. So our cost is in building detectors. We have to build our detectors underground, though, because, because. because uh, there are all these cosmic rays that are that are hitting our detectors and they're making noise and we don't care, we know about cosmic rays, they're boring. So, <laughs> so we go underground to sh the, and then mountain basically works like an umbrella. It shields us from so cosmic how, how rays. how big is yours compared to, what's it, 27 kilometers, was it? That's certain, uh, 3.1 kilometers was our one in Japan. Okay, 3.1, how? Well, our detectors, uh, they range in size from a building to like a smaller building. So the one that I wanted to show, that's called Double Show, and it's in France actually, uh, is about 10 meters high. So with that one, what we actually, yes, that's the one. So we can, uh -huh, move that one, let me show. So this is. So can you show the slide, please? Okay, so what we are... There it is. Yes, so what we are watching there is it's like a actually our... Reactor. Yes, yes, it's that's our neutrino source. That's what I'm saying. Our neutrino source is free for us. Nuclear plants are expensive, but they're already there. Yeah. So they have to be kind enough to tell us how much energy they're producing. We have to be very nice to them, because if you don't know how much energy they're producing, we don't know how many neutrinos they're producing, because these two are exactly related. So we are always very nice <laughs> to the nuclear plant. And they're kind enough to give us the numbers. Uh, and then once we know the numbers, we actually observe neutrinos with two detectors. So you see the lines uh, going from the two cores. So for yeah. people that are not aware, the, the big columns are just the chimneys. Yeah. That's not the nuclear reactor. <laughs> the nuclear reactor is the little uh, cupola things, two of them. Yeah. And they produce neutrinos, and then we have two detectors. They're both underground, and you're kind of shown the lines as the neutrinos travel. And you notice that they're traveling different distances. So what's the trick? Well, we want to see that neutrinos are changing from one type to another. So if, they, if you see them at distance of 400 meters, and then you see them at a distance of a kilometer, you should see less of these neutrinos because they turned into something else. And that's exactly what we did. What do they turn into? Don't say photon. Another flavor. Photon. No, 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 another flavor. They just changed to a different neutrino type. Okay. Change, they changed like a car. <laughs> like a, like a, a mini, mini, uh, yes. mini Cooper. Yes, yeah. yes. And then we, our, our detector can only see the Ferrari. So. <laughs> We see a certain number of them at the, at the near, the, near detector, and then we see much less than we expect in the far detector, and then we say, okay, some of them turn from Ferrari to Mini Cooper. 
So that's the rules of physics changing, isn't yes, it? Yes, yes. And that's something, laws. you know, that's one of my... So we learned about neutrino oscillations in the last decade, basically, in the last 15 years, where we realized this feature. And it's very exciting because it confuses the theorists. Yeah. That's the call of every experimentalist. Is so to when you do theoretical physics like uh -huh. this, I mean, I can imagine, you know, your offices must be loaded with little scraps of paper where you uh -huh. draw things out and try to, you know, figure out something yes. that you hadn't really figured mm -hmm. out yet and all that, or try to compare mm -hmm. with something you read or got from somebody else. But anyway, I mean, that's this very theoretical. You know, mm -hmm. You'll never see it. Uh, maybe you'll see some kind of report from a big machine or a cloud chamber, mm -hmm. that, but you'll never see it. And the question is, I mean, do you, do you as physicists dream that your experimental physics will somehow be made into something that is tangible? I mean, like Einstein. Mm -hmm. I mean, he saw it, the mushroom cloud, it was there. I mean, that, you know, there's all the theoretical physics in the world wouldn't do that. but. But they led to that cloud and all that destruction. So, query. I mean, do you, do you ever think, you know, what is this going to do on a on a physical level, on a on a ordinary day to day world level? Uh, I would say that I doubt that our investigations about quarks or neutrinos are going to have direct applications to everyday life. But the tools that we use have incredibly powerful applications to, to life, uh, to medicine, to computing. Example. OK, example number one, the most famous example from high energy physics. Uh, there was a computer programmer at CERN, the European Laboratory for High Energy Physics uh, in Geneva, who wrote a memo to uh, his boss in the CERN computing department about how to handle the experiments at LEP, one of the big international uh, collaborations of physicists. They needed to exchange photos, text files, uh, all kinds of documents and pictures. And so he devised this system involving hypertext, uh, and uh, it would be connecting computers that were all networked. So he wrote a memo about this, very clearly laid it all out for his boss, who said, well, yeah, interesting, but a little vague, vague but exciting. And this guy was allowed to work on that. Tim Berners-Lee was his name. And this was, he was... He invented the World Wide Web. Yes. This, this is the CERN Computing Department. I thought he was an physics. IT guy, but no. CERN Computing Department. Okay, okay. Oh, interesting. See, you can do other science. It's possible. Okay, so that's, that's an example. So I think... Uh, the World physics, Wide Web is not a product of this, though. It's not a product of our experiments, no. That uh, was, of his experiments. Does Berners-Lee's physics led to the World no, no, Wide Web? He had to solve a problem for the LEP experimental physicists for international collaboration of high energy physicists CERN. This yeah. was his solution, the World Wide Web. <gasps> wow. So it came from physics. Yes. That's right. And so the possibilities are unlimited. Yeah. I mean, you can have a difficult theoretical question. You can find an answer that will just step across the street and be something yeah. that affects the world. Yeah. Let me give you one example from matter and antimatter, just so you have something concrete. I'm still thinking of what kind of a person a negative Juliet is. Probably really mean. <laughs> <laughs> she should be identical except for her charge. <laughs> Highly charged. According to physics. <laughs> okay, so remember there are electrons and the positrons. When they meet, they annihilate and produce two photons, two back-to-back -back photons. Okay, so in hospitals they have a machine called a PET scanner stands for Positron Emission Tomography. We have one in Hawaii here in Queens Hospital, for example. So you give a patient a radioisotope, a short-lived radioisotope that contains positrons. These positrons annihilate. They come meet electrons in regions of high metabolic activity and make two back-to-back -back photons that are recorded in an array of crystals, like a high-energy physics detector surrounding the patient. This like allows crystals? What, like, like ice crystals? Like uh, they're sodium iodide, the uh, big, heavy, transparent uh, yeah. things that are good for detecting high energy photons. You can see it. Yeah, yeah. Sure. They produce light, a little yeah. amounts of light, basically. Okay. Then okay. You can see them and the support. crystals are the key Th that's the detection. to the positron, detection. I mean, to the PET. Yeah. yeah. So, the, so, so inside the patient, there's matter and antimatter annihilation going on at regions of high metabolic activity. These are traced out in pictures uh, that you take with the PET scanner. You can diagnose certain kinds of cancer. It's very good for studying the brain. So. Who would have thunk? Yeah. 
Yeah. So that's way better than uh, x-rays. Way it's light, different. There, light years there, of there, are, there are a bunch of different methods of medical imaging. That's one that came from physics. Another that came from physics, but not particle physics, is nuclear magnetic resonance, now called MRI. Flipping spins of hydrogen uh, protons up and down and looking at their uh, the frequency of the radio waves that are associated with that. Yeah. And keep in mind that the, that the physicist actually inventing nuclear magnetic resonance did not care at all <laughs> about the medical applications. They were yeah. just looking at the spins and they were well, trying to study that. That's a really interesting. But then the application comes out. And basically that's how it works. We have very challenging problems. And in order to solve these challenging problems, we have to devise new detectors, new methodologies. And it's, it's like a gamble. Sometimes it's really going to be useful for us to answer our physics questions. But often, more often than not, you actually get up with a device that has a beautiful application in medical physics or elsewhere. So it's, it's not predictable in a sense, but the, the, you know, <laughs> the record is good. But, but you need somebody, <laughs> you need a, a facilitator, an intervener, uh, somebody who will translate from the physics to the MRI or the PET. Right. right? So who is, who is that? Who well, does usually, that? Uh, usually when something great is invented, word spreads to other physicists, to engineers, and they, they'll, they'll grab it right away. So you're trying to tell me that physicists <laughs> do not live in a world of exclusively of physics. They're actually, they actually put their pants on one leg at a time and uh, they actually do things other than physics at some times in their lives. Oh, and it's also industry keeps an eye on us. <laughs> I don't know. If, if they talk you, to people. I don't, I don't know if you'll like this statistic, but uh, uh, it's something that comes from the American Physical Society. Okay. So as you know, quantum mechanics is a key element of our daily lives. There are all kinds of interesting things like lasers and semiconductors that all nuclear magnetic resonance all depend on quantum mechanics. So the American Physical Society estimates that 30% of the U.S. economy is based on quantum mechanics. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds pretty ambitious. <laughs> aggressive, aggressive conclusion. Anyway. So anyway, you guys, I mean, we could go on, couldn't we? This is, we're just exploring. We're just yes. <laughs> sort of, you know, the guy who doesn't know any physics meets the guys who do. What happens? Oh, photons everywhere. <laughs> Well, that's, you know, that's what we try to make people realize, that there is so much physics around us, we should enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, we should. It's a great story. Yeah. So anyway, this is uh, Thomas uh, Browder and uh, Helena Mar Maricic. That's right. Uh, both from the College of Natural Sciences at UH Manoa, uh, sharing their research projects and their, and their teaching, if you will, on, on what it's like in, in the, the, the tiny world. Can, can, do we have time physics. for a comment on outreach by Helena? Okay. One minute. So uh, I'd just like to point to the two programs that are going on at the uh, College of Natural Sciences and also at uh, our department. We have an open physics house every November, usually uh, Saturday before Thanksgiving. Everyone is welcome. We have organized tours by the schools where we uh, do try to bring our research closer to students, make it interesting, engaging. Uh, but literally anyone is welcome. We, we, I remember a couple of years ago. Uh, I think they advertise it in the newspaper. Uh, they reach to the schools directly, but I remember one year we had a, a Chinese teacher with his two daughters <laughs> that like fifth grade <laughs> came in and then we talked like this. And, and it was, you know, uh, a lot of people get uh, interested by uh, watching PBS actually and uh, from NOVA and then they, they just get very you know, curious about the particle physics. The other program is Expanding Your Horizons. Uh, it's actually the first year we started this this year, uh, where we try to address the problem that the, that the girls from fifth grade and up start, start losing uh, interest in science. Up to that age, it's all the same, boys and girls. And somehow that something happens and uh, we have these workshops, like hands-on workshops with uh, female faculty uh, from physics, from chemistry, from biology, where we actually uh, give them little projects and they work and they go through three different areas uh, to kind of show them that that uh, science is cool for girls and uh, that it's interesting and you know basically to encourage and and fight this uh, trend that girls are losing sense in science. Yeah, so and, like and it very well could be that that um, Romeo was the anti-Romeo rather than Juliet. Right. You know, that's right. Yeah. Yeah.
Because <laughs> we are fighting like uh, uh, centuries of prejudice, right? <laughs> so right it's not here, an gonna, easy, we are getting there, that. but it's not an easy fight. <laughs> can, I, can I give a film recommendation? So there's this movie, Particle Fever. We did some outreach for that earlier this uh, year. Yeah. That's a great and inspiring way to uh, learn about particle physics. It's a commercial and, and movie, extremely entertaining. Movie. But I Very think it allows people to sense the excitement of actually doing particle experimental fever. particle physics, yes. Anyway, thanks you guys. This is Think Tech. We'll be back with Kali Akina and uh, Ehana Kako in a few minutes. But for now, thank you so much, Tom and Helena. Thank you thank for you. inviting us. Thank you. Thank you. We enjoyed it.